Hey, good morning, New Vision. Thank you so much for being involved in our online worship service. I know we have more of you today because we're not uh, gathering either at Battlefield or Buchanan, but we're glad that you've chosen to worship with us uh, online today. And I hope perhaps you're gathered with your family there in your home and maybe even some friends. You have some friends and gathering you for worship. I want to say welcome to you guys. We're glad that you've chosen to worship. I understand this is a a really uh, difficult time in the life of our country. And I think it's good for us just to, to, to pull away for this hour and worship the Lord. God will do some really neat things. Just a reminder, there is a prayer request tab uh, that you can click on, and that would be a way to, to submit some prayer requests uh, so we could be praying for you and for your family and for some needs that you have. There's also a next steps tab. So anything that you need, uh, whether that's a decision about what it means to follow Christ or baptism or finding a small group, you can just click on that next steps tab and we would love to follow up with you. Also, it's a chance to give online. The ministries obviously are, are still going on. So it gives you a chance just to, to give online and giving is a part of worship. So hopefully that you will take advantage of that. Uh, during this time. And one of the things about uh, worry, fear, anxiety, when we uh, turn our attention to worshiping the Lord, which we're about to do, it's amazing how that begins to change the way we feel. So I want us just right there in our homes as we're watching this, let's just worship the Lord in the midst of this difficult time and look forward to what God's going to do. You're going to hear a great message from Pastor Nick. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you join us in standing, we're going to get excited and worship our God who is worthy, holy, sovereign, a promise keeper. So tonight, this moment, let's worship with all our heart, knowing His faith is on us. We sing, don't lose heart, oh my soul, oh my soul. Gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There 
it is so in our lives that God is all. He is worthy of our worship. We say, creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we hear Christ be magnified.
great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my
What is going on, everybody? How are you? <laughs> that was a reluctant good. We're good, Nick. Just, whoo, here we go. For those who I do not know, my name is Nick, and I get the privilege of being one of the pastors here at New Vision. And I, let me just go ahead and say this. I love doing what I get to do. I love being able to share the truth of God's word and being able to see him not only change people, but change circumstances and just he is an agent of change. And over the last few weeks, and maybe for the last few months for you, it has been a hard, hard season. Can I get an amen? I was having some conversations this week. I was talking to a friend about dealing with cancer. I was talking to a friend about losing a loved one. I was talking to a friend, actually my brother, about his diagnosis with some heart issues he is having. There were tornadoes in Nashville. We have this virus that we're unsure of a lot of details about. It has just been a heavy, heavy season. And as I think about the season and I think about what we've been walking through, sometimes you go, God, do you know what is going on? Because I believe, let me speak for me and let me not speak for you. Sometimes I believe that if I'm a follower of Christ, then everything in my life is going to be good and go as planned. But here is what is true. Whenever I survey the entirety of Scripture, not once... Does it say things are always going to be good? Not once does it say things are always going to be easy, but what it does say is that in the midst of the broken, in the midst of the bad, in the midst of the unknown, we have a king who is still good. And that is a truth that we have to fix our eyes on. And sometimes God does not work in our timetable, does he? We want that answer to that prayer. We want him to come through when we want him to come through. But here's the thing. We can't rush a God who is, who is outside of time because he sees the whole picture, and we trust that he knows what he is doing. But we have to remember this, and this is what is true. God does his best work in the midst of what is broken and chaotic. You might go, Nick, I don't, I don't know if I believe you. Well, while you were still a sinner, broken, what did he do? He showed up and showed out, y'all. He gave his life for you in the midst of what is broken. You go, well, Nick, that's just one example. Okay, I'll give you another one. There was this broken, rugged cross that he surrendered his life on, and he was in the tomb for three days. Y'all remember that? What happened? He mic dropped and said, death, where is your stink? Because in the midst of what is broken is where sometimes God does his best week. And y'all, I'm just telling you, the timing of the Lord is so good. We're in Romans 8. We're continuing. We're going to have this passage, Romans 8, 28. If you're not familiar with it, you'll become familiar with it. Hopefully, it'll become one of your favorite verses. Hopefully, you will remind yourself of what is true, and you will walk in it. And last week, we were reminded about freedom, that we have this freedom that is rooted in the completed work of Jesus, everybody. So what does that mean? That means it's not rooted in your behavior or your good deeds or anything that you can do but that your freedom is rooted in the completed work of Christ, and that is hope's firm foundation, everybody. We don't put our hope in someone who is still dead in the tomb. We don't put our hope in someone that is far away. No, we put our hope in someone who is close, that lived as a human for 33 years. What does that mean? He knows what it's like to struggle and to walk and to walk through some stuff. Our hope has a firm foundation, and his name is Jesus. And we are going to be reminded of this truth tonight as we walk through Romans chapter 8. And I'm excited to walk with you. Maybe you're in a place today where you're like, Nick, I'm having a hard time remembering what is true. You will be reminded today. Maybe you're in a place where you have forgotten where your hope is placed Today you will be reminded where your hope should be placed, not in things of this world, but in a king who has overcome the world. Maybe you're in this place and you're confused and you are wondering if God sees you and he knows you and if he loves you based on the circumstances ahead of you. Let me tell you today in this place that he sees you, he knows you, and he loves you full. And so as we navigate through Romans chapter 8, 
May we be reminded and may God do a work in us and through us in this place so that we can walk out of here differently, remembering the truth of our king and walking with accordance of his ways and his calling. So let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are our hope and you are secure. Jesus, thank you that you loved us in the midst of broken and chaotic things. Thank you that you are for us. Thank you that you've made a way where there was no way. Thank you that you know what you are doing. May I say it again? Thank you that you know what you are doing even when it seems as if you don't, you do. Thank you that you're in the business of leveraging what is broken for your glory. May you continue to do so. Thank you that this is not going to be the time in which you stop being faithful. Thank you. So Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we thank you. And Jesus, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. If you have your Bibles or your phones or you're looking at your notes, we're going to start in Romans chapter 8. We're going to begin in verse number 26. In this passage, Brady started it last week through this passage. But in this passage, Paul is talking about how to navigate pain and suffering and struggle. That's interesting, isn't it? Where we're about to read, Paul is addressing this church in Rome about the struggle of life and about the unknown and about the pain and about the suffering and about the persecution. Because at this time, the bride was being persecuted. And he is speaking to them and reminding them of what is true. Even though all around them seems chaotic, he's reminding that they have a firm foundation of Jesus. I would say that's a very timely word. Can I get an amen? Verse number 26 says this. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Here's the good news. Have you ever been in a place where you're like, I don't even know what to say? You ever been in a place where you are devoid of words to say? You ever been in a place where you're just like, I don't even know what to say or what to do? And what I love is what Paul reminds us is the Holy Spirit prays on your behalf because he knows your heart. He knows you, and he goes before the Father on your behalf. So you have a part of the Trinity that is praying on your behalf. That's a good place to say amen, everybody. And I love the fact that it says, with grunts and groans that are too deep for understanding. He is in the midst of the pain with you, y'all. He goes, "Woo! I know it's hard, but I'm with you. And the king is before you. And the king hears you. And the king sees you. And you don't have to have the words. Just come. Let's get together. Let's remind ourselves what is true and let us pray because I'm praying on your behalf. And y'all, when I was reading that this week, I was just like, thank you. Jesus for the Holy Spirit that prays on my behalf. Thank you that I have a God who is not far off, but a God who is near and a God who has put his very spirit within me. So I don't have to have the words because he understands. Samuel Zwimmer, he was an apostle and missionary to Islam. He says this, true prayer, I love this, is God the Holy Spirit talking to God the Father in the name of God the Son and the believer's heart in the prayer room. Come on, the whole trinity there is together. Praying on our behalf, going before us. Verse number 28. Many have underlined this verse. This is up in people's houses because it's a worthy verse to put on your wall. It says this. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are rooted in him, who have been called according to his purpose. Can I read that again? Let me, I'm gonna, I don't even need your permission. I'm going to read it again. And we know their security. And we know that is rooted and we know that it's foundational and it's, it's on bedrock. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, 
who have been called according to his purpose. Everything in life is not good, but in the midst of it, God is. Ligon Duncan says it this way. There are many things that are not good. Some of those things are things that are done to us or which we experience, which are no fault of our own. Others of those things are things that we do ourselves that are not good. And Paul is not saying all things are good to believers. No, he is saying that God uses all things, even evil, even pain, even suffering. He uses all things, everything individual, comprehensively for the good of the believer. God uses his all, everybody. There is nothing beyond his reach. There is nothing he cannot redeem, and there is nothing he cannot use. He is the great redeemer. And as we continue to walk in this life, this is a verse that we are going to have to remind ourselves often and on purpose and intentionally fix our eyes on so that we will remember that when the storm rages the hardest, that the Lord is in the business of using it, leveraging it for the good of those who are rooted in him. Verse number 29 and 30, if you've been listening to the podcast, Pastor Brady did a great job walking us through this text. And a lot of people get thrown off because there's this word predestination. Now, some of you in this room are like, whoa, yeah, let's talk about predestination. Some of y'all is like, is that a beach in Florida? So some, we are on varying levels of this. But let me go ahead and say this before we even read into it. Paul was not writing this to the church in Rome to make them stumble or to make them struggle or for them to fix their eyes on this and forget what God is really up to. Can I go ahead and say that? That was not Paul's intent. And Paul is writing to this church that's suffering and struggling and reminding them that their God is truly in control and he knows what he is doing. And because he is sovereign, he knows how the story ends. Verse number 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So you're going, okay, Nick, what does all that mean? That means for this, one, God is sovereign. That means he knows all things. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and he knows what he is doing. For new, he has known you before you were born. That's how he foreknew you. And then he goes predestined. His destiny and his outlook and his goal for your life, everybody, I'm about to blow your mind. You're going to be like, whoa, I have such a deep, rich theological understanding now. He designed and destined for you to be like Jesus. That was the goal from the onset, everybody. The goal for your life was for you to be like Jesus. And some of you are like, well, I knew that. That was the goal for your life. And here's the other good news about this. God did all the work. We just had to accept the gift. Salvation is a work of God from beginning to end. What does that mean? But while you were still a sinner, you know what God did? He stepped out of glory, put on some flesh, chased you down, loved you full, and said, I'm offering my life for you as a sacrifice so that we can set right what was set wrong by your own brokenness and your own sin. And I'm going to take it all the way to the end, and I'm going to be resurrected from the grave so you know that death no longer has a hold on you. And the only part you get to play in this thing called grace is to accept it. Jesus did it all, everybody. He did it all from beginning to end. And we get to say yes to that gift. And I also love this. I love that in verse 30, he puts it in the past tense. Why would he put it in past tense? Like Paul is writing to the church in Rome. Why would he put it in past tense? Because Jesus already did it all. He paid it in full. He did it all because that 
is what Jesus does. And he has made a way where there was no way. And he uses everything in life to make us more like Jesus. Why? Because the end goal, hear me everybody, the end goal for you is not that you're good, not that you have money in the bank. The end goal of your life when you have surrendered control of your life to God is that you become more and more like Jesus. So he leverages it all so that you can be more like Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the goal. There is nothing better than that. Jesus is the ultimate goal, and God is so good that he uses all the broken, all the waywardness, all the stuff so that he can remind us of what is true, and he will use that as a tool to make us more like his son. Why? Because he is good at leveraging the broken and all things for his glory. God leverages all things to make us more like like Jesus. Here we, here's the uncomfortable part we don't like. That even means the pain and the suffering, everybody. Because if you're anything like me, you don't like the pain and the suffering. Amen? Like, I much rather God just make everything good instead of turning the bad for and using it for good. I much rather him just like, hey, I would rather skip the bad. Let's just go straight to the redemption. Let's just go straight to the good. God, I don't really want to walk through this, but here's the thing that you have to understand. God knows that the best thing about life is for him to get the glory so that people can see how good he is. And he will use and he will leverage all situations to remind us of his glory and his goodness. And here's the hard part. That sometimes means that he doesn't lead us away from the fire, but in the midst of it. And that's a sobering thing, isn't it? Because a lot of my prayers go a lot like this. Please, Lord, please protect me from the fire. And sometimes the Lord is like, hey, Nick, I need the fire to refine you to make you more like me. And that's not a fun conversation. But can I just tell you, seeing what God uses with the broken things of my life and seeing his redemption in them, I see there's no way I could get here without walking through that. For some of you, you have walked through some hard things. You're currently walking through some hard things. Us, as a country, in the world, we're walking through hard things. But I'm telling you this, God is going to leverage it and use it for his glory. I promise you. How do I know that? Because I take a look back and I see what he's already done. And there's this perfect story tucked away in Daniel chapter 3 that I love that I think gives us a great picture of Romans 8, 26 through 30. I think it's a great picture of God working for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. And some of you might be familiar with it. These are these three friends. Their name is Shadrach, Meshach, and come on, you guys are so smart. Bible drill, let's go. If you didn't know, it's okay. I'm about to tell you all about them in a really, really quick way. But I think it is so good to go with Romans chapter 8. There is this king named Nebuchadnezzar who was all about King Nebuchadnezzar. He wanted people to bow to him. He wanted people to treat him as if he was a god. He was so about himself that he built a golden image that whenever you saw it or the trumpets would shout, you were supposed to bow down and say, hey, this is king. This is God. But see, there were these three young men who were convinced that there was another king who sat on the throne, and he had called them in and said, listen, you. I know that, you know, you heard the decree, you heard what I said, that when the horns blow, you're supposed to bow down to this golden image, but I hear through the grapevine that you are being disobedient. So I just want you to know, so I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you an opportunity to bow. And then these three young men who were called for God's use and purpose says this in verse 16 of Daniel 3. Let's hear this again with new ears. And maybe if you're in this place, you're hearing it for the first time. May it change you. Verse 16 says this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him. So either one spoke for the many or they said this in unison. I can just hear it. Listen here, King. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. You better come on. This is stanky, y'all. Bring it on. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, check this out. The God we serve is able to deliver us from it. Let's pause. 
This is the most powerful man in this, na- in this area, in this country right now. And they go, listen, listen, let me just go ahead and tell you something. We ain't scared of you. We not. You are just a man. I, I am following the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I got nothing to fear because he's got this. I just want you to know that the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Verse 18 is one of the verses that I do not like, but I love at the same time. Verse 18. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. They say, listen, even if we go to the fire and we're burnt up, God is still in control. He's still going to use it, and he's still going to not freak out because God is bigger than this situation, even if it means I go in the fire. I read that, and I'm like, whoo, what would it look like if my life was the same way? Like, Lord, I would love to be saved from this, but even in the midst of it, I know you're working. Lord, I would like for all the answers to be answered and all the eyes to be dotted, but even if it's not, I know that you are no less in control than if I was saved from the fire because I know that even if I go to the fire, you are still with me, you go before me, and you got my back, so I trust you. You're going to be shocked. Verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar got mad, y'all, because notice, his identity was rooted in people bowing to him. He needed that. So here are these three guys that aren't even from around here. They are, they are people who were pulled from their own nation, and they're brought here to serve him, and they are making him look like he is less than what he is claiming to be. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, this false king, this little king, was flexing his power. It's like, okay, the furnace is going to be hotter, the men are going to be stronger, and we will see that you will bow to me on this day. Meshach and Abednego, and throw them in the blazing furnace is what he says. Verse 21. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. I don't know if you noticed this before about this story, but you know that God could have intervened before that moment, right? I don't know if you've ever thought about it. Like God could have went, "Er!" you don't have to go through that fire. You've gone, you you were obedient, you were brave, You you don't have to go through the fire. But no, we see that God allows them to go into the midst of a fire. And you know, I've been going, man, that's crazy. Why would he do that? Well, I'm thinking, come on, God. You don't have to do it like that. Let the brothers go now. Why would he do that? Can I tell you why he would allow that to happen? God gets even more glory from saving them from the midst of the fire than saving them before the fire. And can I just tell you, uh, for me, this is something that I'd much rather read. This is something that I I love opening up God's word and go, whoa, look what they did. Praise the lamb. For me, I love reading stories about these faithful followers of Jesus and people who have fixed their eyes on God, who are are walking and being obedient and recognizing that God is in control and that he is good at leveraging the broken things. I love to read about it, everybody. You know what I don't like? It's like playing in the role. I much rather God go, just make a way where there was no way, God, so I can walk through on dry ground. See, I I prefer that. I don't like the story where I have to step in the Jordan before he pulls the waters back. I don't like that. But can I just tell you, the king sometimes allows me to go into the midst of the fire 
For one, is he's going to get more glory, but for two, he's going to reveal himself in a deeper, more meaningful way. And there's something to be learned in the fire, everybody. There is. Verse 24. Y'all ready for it? Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet. Why would that brother do that? I'm about to tell you. In amazement and asked his advisors, check this out, I love it. Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? He's like, whoa, 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 I know I'm not crazy. We'll see later if you keep reading Daniel, the brother does go crazy. But I know I'm not crazy right now. And I know there was Shadrach, there was Meshach, there was Abednego. We threw them into the fire. My man got burnt up, but there was three of them in the fire. So why, oh, why do I see something different? They replied, certainly, your majesty. You're right, your majesty. You're right. You're you good with math. There's three people in there. <laughs> Verse 25. He said, look. I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed and the fourth check it looks like a son of the gods in the midst of the fire I see one that looks like the son better say it son of God in the midst of the fire Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. I just love this scene, y'all. I love it. They were bound, thrown into the fire, his men burned up, they're walking around. And here's what I love, they're walking around and they seem secure even though they're in the midst of the fire. Why would they feel so secure and just be walking around like they're walking in the park? Why? Because who was with them? Because who was with them? So they're walking around, they're like, we're cool. I'm not even hot. My clothes aren't even going to smell like smoke. You know why? Because who's in this fire with me? See, he didn't leave me because the fire came. No, he was in the midst of the fire, and now you're better able to see him in the midst of the fire. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm. That'll preach, y'all. But can I just tell you again? I'd much rather not go through the fire, but the fire sometimes is necessary. And here's what God does. He leverages the fire that was meant for death and leverages it for refinement. That is not just true of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, everybody. That is not something that's just true in the Old Testament. That's not just something that's true in biblical days. That is something that is very much true today, right here, right now. Why? Because the same king is in the fire with us. He has not gone anywhere. He has not gone running for cover. He is in the midst and he is going to be even more revealed as we continue to walk through this fire, fixing our eyes on him and walking well with him. He has not left you in the fire. He has not left me in the fire. He is not going to leave me in my broken state. Why? Because he leverages and uses it for his glory and for my good. And I'm telling you, that allows me to walk better. And Tony Evans, y'all, I love me some Tony Evans. He says this. Sometimes God rescues us from things. Sometimes he rescues us out of things. And sometimes he changes us in things. Let him choose. He knows best. And I'm sure... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would leverage the, world, the words of Joseph who said, you know what, brothers, you meant this for evil, but God used it for good. Now, that is an enemy that wants to use plenty of things for evil, but the Lord is in the leveraging and the redemption business, and he will use it for good and for his purposes because he's already won. Romans 8. Let's jump back in and we'll finish up. Verse 31. See, Paul recognizing that 
Jesus has done salvation all the way. We just need to accept it. He gets into this celebration of man. Look at what God has done. And best, based on this firm foundation that we have our hope in, the hope of Jesus, here's now how we can walk even better. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Can't you see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking around and echoing the same exact thing? We just showed Nebuchadnezzar what was up. If God is for us, if he's in the fire with us, then what can be against us? Let me walk with a holy confidence because I know where my hope is founded and where it is rooted. And here's the good news, everybody. We can join our voices with those of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Apostle Paul. Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Y'all better listen. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for the sake we face death all the day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, I don't know if you caught it in verse 37, but when it says we are more than conquerors, in Greek, that word is Nike. In the Greek, that word is Nike. Nike means victory. And in verse 37, it means super victorious. And you know me, y'all, I have a dysfunction. I admit it, but I'm in process, okay? So I want you to know I went and I purchased a box full of victory. Listen, I paid for it in full, y'all, and I'm not returning it. I think that's similar to what the king has done on your behalf. See, with his life, he purchased a victory that is unshakable and unmovable, and it doesn't return void. And so he is encouraging us in Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Now listen, you are rooted in victory that has been purchased on your behalf. So it is time for you to bust out the victory. Woo! It is time for you to bust out the victory. And listen, don't just look at it. Don't just talk about it. Don't just be like, I heard about this victory, y'all. No, see, it was purchased on your behalf, so you know what that means? You can put it on and you can walk in it. You can put it on and you say, you know what? I am rooted in victory. I didn't buy it, but I'm receiving it. I didn't earn it, but it gave it to me anyways. He has paid for it in full. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk in victory. You know what happens sometimes? Is dirt will come your way. There will be some obstacles in your journey, but you keep walking. You keep walking in that victory. And you say, you know what? My victory is secure. I can walk in it. I can talk about it. You better watch out because nothing is going to change this victory. See, there are moments when you might not see it, but victory is working for the good. There are moments when you not, might not feel it, but victory is being worked out for good. So I want you to stand to your feet and I want you to sing with me what is true today, what's true tomorrow, and what is true forever. Let's go, church. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop.
Sometimes for us, we are guilty of seeing God through our circumstances instead of seeing our circumstances through the lens of God. And what I love about the Lord is that he paid in full for me to walk in victory. But here is what is true, everybody. You have to accept the gift and you have to put the shoes on. Because victory is secured, but you've got to accept it. And so maybe you find yourself in this place and you've never accepted the victory that has been sealed and that has been cemented on the completed work of Jesus. If that is you in this place, listen, we're going to have friends down front. We'll have friends in the next step room that would love to tell you how to say yes to the victory that has been sealed in the completed work of a king. May we be a people in a time when circumstances look most dim. May we be a people that are fully convinced that our God is able to use the most broken and chaotic of things for his glory and even for our good. And even when it doesn't come on our timetable, he is no less good and no less on the throne. So friends, brothers, Sisters, know this, that you have a God who goes before you, that you have a God in the midst of the fire with you, and you have a king who has your back and has invited you to be a part of a kingdom that will last forever. Hey guys, thank you for joining us online today. We hope it was a great experience. While we know it's not ideal, what a gift it is to still worship together. What a gift to still dig into the God's Word and continue this series through Romans. You know, we're stepping into our last week of our podcast. And if you haven't stepped into our podcast with us, you should really uh, jump in on the journey. We are uh, on Spotify. We're on iTunes. And if uh, you are unfamiliar with podcasts, you can go to our website, click the word podcast and follow along. After Romans, we're going to continue the podcast and go through the book of John. It's a really, really neat thing, and this is a really, really neat time. Uh, while it's not ideal, we do see it as an opportunity, an opportunity to equip you and an opportunity to equip other churches. You know, we are going to be shooting some worship that we're going to share with other churches if they choose to use it. But also, we're opening up our doors so that other pastors can come in and uh, we will record their sermons and uh, get it up on YouTube so they can share it with their congregation. There are a lot of churches that aren't blessed. There are a lot of churches that just aren't meeting this morning. Uh, so we can be grateful in this time that uh, we have the resources, that we have the ability and the skill set in which to worship together. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so, so grateful that you did choose to, to join us. Uh, one more thing, if you want updates on the coronavirus, you know, kind of decisions that we're making uh, in the life of the church, you can simply go to our website, newvisionlife.com, and uh, there is a section there that has up-to-date information as well as our social media. You can follow us on uh, Facebook, like us on Facebook, or uh, follow us on Instagram. So uh, we hope to see you around. We hope to see you here uh, soon. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you.